Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Noah Petro. He is project scientist for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to the show. We'll talk about the lunar surface, the Artemis missions, as well as the return of humans to the moon. But first, we're going to visit the Chime Radio Telescope in Canada, which recorded 535 fast radio bursts coming from around the cosmos. Then we're going to zoom in on Jupiter's system of moons as the Juno spacecraft records the first close-up images seen in 20 years from the surface of the giant moon Ganymede. Next, we're going to take a look at a new study finding that moons orbiting gas giants could be home to water even without a parent star. Less than a generation ago, astronomers saw the first fast radio burst coming from space. These events are now thought to be fairly common, but these FRBs last an extraordinarily short time, making it challenging for astronomers looking to record their passing. The CHIME Radio Telescope, a unique instrument in Canada with no moving parts, is able to record radio waves over half of the Earth's sky every day. In its first year of operation, astronomers at CHIME found 535 FRBs evenly distributed around the sky, although the cause of these newly discovered eruptions remains unanswered. The first close-up photos of Jupiter's giant moon Ganymede were recently recorded by the Juno spacecraft. These images show the largest moon of the solar system in stunning detail. While one image was recorded on the sunlit side of the moon by GenoCam, the other was seen by a navigational camera in light reflected from the giant planet. The next close encounter with Jupiter should come in 2029 when the two spacecraft from the European Space Agency carries out its close encounter with this fascinating planetary system. A new study suggests that liquid water may be found on exomoons of rogue planets. Even without a parent star, a free-floating gas giant could generate enough warmth through tidal forces on moons uh, strong enough to keep water in a liquid state. Combined with an atmosphere consisting of 90% or more carbon dioxide, creating a runaway greenhouse effect, these moons may be able to form life that would never see a star in their sky. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk about our own moon as we visit with Dr. Noah Petro, project scientist on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter about that mission 
and the return of humans to the lunar surface. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Noah Petro. Uh, he is a project scientist for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and he's here to talk about everybody's favorite planetary companion, the moon. Welcome to the show, Noah. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, so I would like to start a little bit uh, for, about talking about uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. What is it for people who may not be familiar with it, and what are we learning well, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, is a mission that's actually been orbiting the moon continuously since June of 2009. So we're coming up on our 12th anniversary of, of orbiting the moon, longer than any mission has ever orbited the moon before. And so what we have done is, is really taken what was supposed to be a two-year mission and turn it into this decade-plus mission of science, of exploration. Our initial goal was to chart out the places that we wanted to send future human and robotic missions. Well, guess what? We're still doing that, but we're also revolutionizing our view of the moon and our understanding of its place in the solar system. We have seven instruments that have been measuring the moon continuously now, essentially, for, for over a decade, revealing a, a wonderful landscape uh, that will be a real treat for future explorers, both human and robotic. Fabulous. And um, so, of course, I think a lot of people are really getting excited about the upcoming Artemis missions, mm -hmm. returning the, returning uh, humans to the moon for the first time since the early 70s. Uh, how is the LRO preparing us for the Artemis mission? LRO's preparations for Artemis are, are akin to the first mappers that would you know, explore a region. Where are the places that you want to go? Where are the rivers, the creeks, the lakes, the oceans? We're doing those sorts of maps for the moon. We're identifying resources, hazards, places we want to explore. So that sort of unlike Apollo, which, which used single snapshot images of places to say, okay, we're going to land here. We're going to do this. We're going to now be armed with a litany of remote sensing data sets that tell us where to go, what resources might be found there, where there might be ice or other volatiles present. And so LRO's now created this four-dimensional atlas in high resolution, four-dimensional because we now map the moon over time and we've been able to see the moon change underneath our feet. And so with that information, we have a, you know, an incredible amount of information about what we want to do and where we want to go when we get there. Hmm. And a few weeks ago, people had a chance to see an, a lunar eclipse over much mm -hmm. of the United States. What do you think is the most surprising fact about the moon that people may not know? Wow. The one most surprising fact about the moon. Well, you know, what surprises me the most about the moon today, you know, there's things that have happened on the moon over four and a half billion years that the moon is this great, as you call it, cosmic companion. Um, I like to think of the moon as the eighth continent of the earth. That when we study the moon, we're learning about the earth. We learn about things that have happened on the moon. The moon is two and a half, you know, I'm sorry, you know, three days away, a quarter of a million miles. It is our attic. The processes that happen on the moon also affect the Earth, but we have this great storage of the entirety of Earth's history on the moon's surface. If you want to understand what was going on four billion years ago, that record on the Earth is gone. Hmm. But the moon, you can go and understand what was happening four billion years ago, three billion years ago, two billion years ago. Um, and so this connection between the, the Earth and the moon is very real. And indeed, when people saw the eclipse and see the moon turn red, that's because the Earth's atmosphere, the, the light passing through Earth's atmosphere, the same reason that we have red sunrises and sunrets, sunsets, that light through the Earth's atmosphere projects onto the surface of the moon. And so those sunrises and sunsets are projected onto the lunar surface, creating that beautiful red glow. The Earth and Moon are intertwined in almost every single way. One of the most surprising things that we're learning about the Moon today is that we can actually see new craters that have formed on the surface of the Moon. We can see changes that are occurring over the life of our mission, over LRO's life. And so the Moon has gone from this, I would say, static object. We knew these things were happening, but now we can actually see them happen and measure and record what's, what's changing on the lunar surface which gives us an unprecedented opportunity to compare the moon 
to just about every other object in the solar system. Hmm. And as people, you know, look, learn about the Artemis program, of course, most of it mm -hmm. rightly is founded on uh, the 2024 mission mm -hmm. uh, to put humans back on the moon. But sometime in 2022, we're going to be launching uh, Artemis 2, which will take mm -hmm. humans in a loop around the moon, which reminds me a little bit, or uh, quite a lot, of uh, the Apollo 8 mission. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how Artemis 2 and Apollo 8 compare? Yeah, you know, I mean, what we're, we want to do with Artemis 8 is still being defined, but, you know, we learned from Apollo 8 and even Apollo 10 and really all of the Apollo missions is the importance of having astronauts observing the moon up close. We could take every possible image of the moon with LRO, but there's nothing better than having a trained pair of eyes looking at the moon up close and personal because they can capture views that we just can't get looking very low off on the horizon to see subtle topography and changes on the lunar surface. And so what I, I hope to see with, with the first orbital Ar Artemis missions are opportunities to get crew, astronauts, looking at the surface of the moon, taking pictures, describing what they see, because that will augment, that will back up all of the data that we have from orbit from LRO. So that perspective will be very important. And, you know, I think begin this connection of humans at the moon talking about the moon in ways that you can only talk about when you're up close, whether it's in orbit or actually on the surface. And so how are things going with Artemis? Sorry. Well, the preparations for Artemis have been, you know, fast and furious. And what I've been most engaged with and interested in is of course the scientific preparations. What are we going to do when we get there? What are the, the science questions we want to ask? Um, and how does that help us decide where we want to go? And so, we're preparing now for Artemis similar to what we were doing, you know, over 50 years ago for Apollo. Let's pick out places that we might want to explore. What do we want to do there? Okay, we want to collect samples. How are we going to do that? What tools do we have to have on hand? What kind of requirements do we have to place on the engineers to build these things? And so it's this, this really exciting time of defining what this next generation, this next era of lunar exploration will look like mm -hmm. and what we want to get out of it. Yeah, so what sort of science would do you think we could be we could be going on it? So, so you know, when we go to the South Pole of the Moon, the, the first science questions that crop to most people's minds is the, the well, we know there are volatiles at the, at the South Pole of the Moon. We've learned over the last ten years that there are volatiles all over the surface of the Moon. But with with the South Pole in particular, where where are volatiles found in abundance? Where can we go and, and harvest those resources? So, I think one of the the fundamental questions that we'll ask is, is, is that of, you know, where is the water? <laughs> where are there resources? Where are there things that we can use? What I'm most excited about is that the South Pole is actually very unique compared to where we went with Apollo because the South Pole has many surfaces that are, again, 4 billion years old, that are ancient terrains that we've never explored. And so with our, our visits to the South Pole, we'll have an opportunity to, to collect those samples that reflect the very earliest portion of the history of the solar system. And so for me, I think it's that, that is what is most captivating is that we'll have this opportunity to go touch surfaces that are 4 billion years old and understand what was going on then. What were the nature of the impactors that were striking the surface then? Um, indeed, how old are those surfaces? We don't actually know. We think they're very old, but those surfaces, those rocks that we get back will date in labs and we'll say, oh, wait a second, they're actually 3 billion years old. And we'll have to go back and revisit all of our assumptions about what we have to do. So that's the, the exciting part of, of exploration is this. we we'll come up with hypotheses and, and then and, and, you know, eventually be able to test them both on the surface and in, in the lab. But for me, it's about this window into the ancient history of the solar system that's most, most exciting for me. Fabulous. So is it mostly, I'm trying to figure out, can we, mm -hmm. this one I'm getting at is what science can we learn from the moon? that will help hmm. us better understand the outer other planets, you know, and the moon, so, the big, big planets, right? Yeah, I, actually, for me, the, the, the most important thing and the, the thing that can easily connect the moon to every other object in the solar system is impacts. Mm -hmm. You know, impact craters are found in abundance on every surface of the moon. They're very rare on the Earth, and that's a good thing. We don't want lots of impacts happening on the Earth all the time. Our atmosphere protects us from them. But on the moon with no atmosphere, you have impacts that occur today 
and four billion years ago preserved on the surface of the moon. And so it's our job when we go to the moon to, to study impact craters and understand what is actually going on when a meteorite strikes the surface of a planetary body, because that process is happening on Mercury, it's happening on Pluto, and it's happening on Mars. And so we take that knowledge of the impact process and can extend it to every other object in the solar system, including back here, um, back here on Earth. And so, um, as you mentioned, I mean, especially at the South Pole, one of the most important things we look, we're going to need to look for, if we want to, you know, have human habitation of the moon is going to be water. Not only does mm -hmm. it come in convenient for water, <laughs> it also comes in really convenient for oxygen, rock fuel, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yep. So what, how are we uh, seeking out water deposits? So one of the things that we've been able to do with the, the, the instruments on LRO is use those instruments to help detect where we think water might be in different ways. And so we come at it not just with one particular instrument, but with three, four, five instruments, and they all point to different places that have varying abundances of, of water, of hydrogen um, at the surface and beneath the surface. And so we use all of these data, data that can kind of constrain the problem. Where do we think the water is gonna be most abundant? You know, we, we, when we got to the moon in 2009, we sent the LCROSS mission along with us. The LCROSS impacted the South Pole of the moon to kick up material and study it in sunlight, which had cool. never been done before. <laughs> it was a wild experiment and it was, a smashing success, pardon the pun. And so <laughs> we wanna go back to the moon and touch the surface and understand, okay, the data from above from, from LRO tells us this, let's ground truth it and actually measure what's in abundance here and over there and then a little bit further away and really understand how it works, how volatiles might vary on a, on a spatial scale. NASA will be sending a rover to the moon, the Viper mission that will really start doing this for an area of the South Pole and of course use that information to, to be in a better position for Artemis. But it, it really comes down to resource prospecting and, and finding out where this material is in what abundance it is in. And then comes the hard question. How do we get that out of the rock, out of the soil and turn it into rocket fuel, drinking water, uh, you know, coolant, things like that. So there's a lot of work to be done, but boy, we're at the, the cusp of this really exciting era of exploration. It's fabulous. And just to finish off, um, following up on that, what is the next step in lunar exploration? Well, there's a lot of things going to be happening in lunar exploration in very fast order. Um, NASA is about to start sending small commercial landers to the lunar surface that will be carrying instruments. Uh, NASA provided instruments to the surface of the moon. So for the first time since 1972, we're sending um, landers to the lunar surface, and we're going to start going all over the moon, not just at the South Pole, but many locations on the near side and begin this scientific exploration of the lunar surface in earnest. That will help prepare us for landings of the scale of Viper, the, the rover mission I just mentioned, as well as of course the larger missions such as Artemis. And so what we'll be doing is, is ramping up our exploration of the moon fast and furious starting really later this year. You know, LRO has been around for 12 years, so we're still there, we're gonna still be participating. But now we'll have this, this second wave of, <laughs> of missions, and uh, it's truly exciting. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Noah. It was great talking with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having yeah. me on. And that was Noah Petro, project scientist for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbit. Next week, we're going to be joined by Brittany Zimmerman. CEO of Yame uh, on her work developing technology for space exploration and for protecting the Earth from environmental catastrophe. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Now we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit the cosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe 
stay healthy and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode to YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm-hmm.